All right, this says we're live. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, bear with us for one second. We just want to verify that this is uh, working now. Um, we're connecting the studio cameras and all that stuff through their computers to my channels, uh, to my channel, and we're making sure everything works. Up, oh, I see my beautiful face right there. <laughs> see my beautiful face? All right, looks like we're good. Are we good, everyone? Just give me a, just a, because I don't want to turn on the volume and stuff. Just make sure you uh, hear the sound. Everything is working. That all work? Yep. Okay. We are live. Everyone's saying we are live. We well are then, live. we'll go ahead and start over. TikTok, time to rock. David Wood and Al Fadi live. We're here in the studio recording a bunch of videos for Al Fadi's site. And we figured why not go live? We went live earlier on Al Fadi's uh, Facebook page. But uh, Al, what have we been doing here today? Well, uh, basically we've been recording a, a new video series, uh, believe it or not, that has to do with uh, Islam and atheism. Now I know this may sound uh, strange to some of your uh, viewers, uh, maybe even mine too, because people do not connect Islam with atheism. But there is a movement right now. In fact, it started at uh, almost around the time of ISIS. It became more uh, at least prevalent, like around 2011, give or take. You can go and Google this. There has been a, a gravitation uh, by young Muslims, young Arab Muslims in particular Middle East, away from Islam and into atheism. And obviously, you know, I, uh, you know, uh, shared this with David, David being an, an ex basically atheist, a believer in Christ. God is using him in a mighty way, of course, among Muslims. And we wanted really as an ex Muslim and ex atheist uh, believers in Christ, both of us to talk about really, is there any correlation between the two? And how can somebody who uh, believed in certain moral values and things uh, of that sort could actually do a drastic change in, in terms of their worldviews and we've been tackling a number of issues anywhere from uh, the, the, the questions uh, that relates to the meaning of life all the way to using Muhammad as an example of moral failures if you wish. Mm -hmm. um, yeah and uh, <laughs> we're, we're gonna go and uh, we're mainly gonna going to take some some questions here but yes it's uh, guys there is an interesting what we've been talking about in, in these videos is we have lots of ex-Muslims, ex-Muslims. Here, here's here's the, the, the sort of transfer of problems that I see. We have lots of ex-Muslims who see a problem, a moral problem with Muhammad, with their prophet. And so they will recognize that, you know, wife beating in Islam, that's the last one we just recorded, that wife beating is immoral, that you shouldn't beat your wife you shouldn't beat her until her skin turns green. It's just bad. The stuff we read about in the Muslim sources is bad. And the Muslims will recognize, hey, wait a minute. If Muhammad is the pattern of conduct for all mankind, he shouldn't be teaching people to beat their wives into submission, right? So they'll recognize this. So notice the problem that they recognize is there's, there's a problem here between believing that Muhammad is the greatest man who ever lived and or that he's the pattern of conduct for all people and that he promotes wife beating, right? That he promotes beating women even until their skin turns green was completely fine, according to Muhammad. So they recognize that these things don't go together and they have to, they have to drop one of their beliefs. Well, they can't drop their belief that Muhammad promoted wife beating. Well, you, you can, and there are Muslims who do that. In other words, there are Muslims who will cling to their belief in Muhammad. And so they'll, they'll try to explain away the wife beating. So they'll have to throw out a bunch of hadith and they'll have to throw out the historical background. And they'll have to reinterpret the Quran and so on. Um, but for people who don't want to do that, who don't want to do that kind of reinterpretation, you just reject your belief that Muhammad is this great man and that he's the pattern of conduct for mankind. And then so they leave Islam, and, but, but some of them become atheists. But notice how, the, notice how the problem doesn't go away. It just transforms into a diff different kind of problem. Because what's the basis for the claim that you shouldn't beat your wife into submission, given nothing but an atheist, uh, nothing but an atheist background, or nothing but an atheist foundation. Uh, just, just to be clear, a atheists generally believe that it's it's wrong to beat women into submission. I'm saying when you say that person, in a completely different culture, in a completely different time, should not have beaten his wife, even if it was normal in that culture, even if it was acceptable, even if he thought he had a revelation from God, he should not have done it. How are you saying? 
anything beyond your feelings? How are you saying anything beyond what your perspective is? The idea here is if you want to say that what Muhammad did was objectively wrong, that it was objectively immoral, that it's something that he should never do regardless of his culture, then you're then you're appealing to moral values that just they don't exist on on atheism. They don't exist given given an atheist framework. And so the 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 what happens is the a Muslim recognizes a tension, a conflict between his belief that Muhammad's greatest man ever and his belief that Muhammad uh, allowed his followers to beat women into submission. And then some people leave Islam and they become atheists. But now there's a new problem that arises. And, and to be clear, I'd, I'd be interested in hearing from atheists how you, how you, uh, how you deal with this problem. I understand I have, a, I have a lot of atheist fans. I have atheists that I work with. I do, I do videos with, with uh, atheists and so on. Um, but then the problem becomes, you shift the problem, you reject, you now reject Islam. But if you become an atheist, now the problem becomes, wait, wait a minute, if wife beating, if beating women into submission is objectively wrong, and it's not just something that depends on your culture or something like that, and it doesn't just depend, how, how do I, how is that, how can I reconcile that with my atheist framework where our moral values are kind of just the product of the way we're wired uh, and influenced by society. Well, if that's all our moral values is, uh, if that's all they are, there's nothing really there that would allow you to condemn someone from a completely different culture in a completely different time. I mean, you can say it, you can believe it's wrong, you can say it's immoral, but there's nothing really in your worldview that shows that it's immoral. So yeah, we're working on a series that, that, that draws attention to these things, that draws attention to um, how it, these issues are problems for Muslims because the Muslims think that Muhammad's the greatest man ever, and so they've got a, they've got a conflict here, but there are also problems for, for atheists who are rejecting Muhammad as a prophet based on these things when the question then becomes, how do they justify their belief that Muhammad has done something objectively uh, immoral? And so anyway, we're kind of exploring, exploring that, but uh, in addition to those, uh, these are kinds of questions that we'd also want to bring atheists into the mix for, because you want atheists, you don't want to misrepresent atheism, you don't want to misrepresent the position, you want them to to be able to give a defense uh, of, of their, their own case. So um, I'll be doing that in the, the coming months as well. All right, yep. got anything you want to respond to yet? Or? I mean, I agree with everything you said, and that's why it's a groundbreaking, really, uh, you can call it experiment if you wish, but uh, we're hoping that uh, you know others hopefully will follow suit. And uh, we really want to reach out to those ex-Muslims who claim to be atheists, uh, in our view, David, uh, that they're open-minded now. They, they have made really a leap, uh, definitely, out of the bondage of Islam into a territory where maybe even the gospel is more uh, uh, prevalent. Maybe they will more be, be more receptive to it. Although, I mean, you and I have heard this argument before that some Christians feel like, you know, uh, this is a bad move, actually, on the Muslim's part. Mm -hmm. Any idea yep. why they think this way, David? Um. You mean as far as Muslims becoming atheists? Right. I mean, they, they feel like it's a discouraging move, actually. Yeah. So, uh, so I have um, I, I hear from lots of ex-Muslims. Um, I hear from lots of ex-Muslims who are ex-Muslims because they're watching my videos. Now, here's what lots of Christians find disturbing, but that I don't find disturbing. Um, lots of the people who leave Islam after watching my videos, they become Christians, right? They, so they're on my channel, they're watching the videos and so on. But there are also plenty of Muslims who leave Islam after watching my videos and don't believe what I say about God and don't believe what I say about Jesus and they become atheists, right? In other words, you can say, yes, I agree with your argument here, David, but I don't agree with your argument over here. And there, there are people who do that, right? They say, I, I agree with your argument against Muhammad. I agree with your arguments against Quran. I agree with those arguments. I'm rejecting Islam, but I don't accept your arguments for, you know, the resurrection or something like that. And they become atheists. And uh, there are lots of Christians who are bothered by this. Oh, my goodness, they became, they became atheists and they think this is really, really horrible thing. Um, I don't regard it. I don't regard it as a horrible thing when someone leaves Islam and becomes uh, an atheist. Yes, I'm, I'm convinced that the, the person is wrong for becoming an, an atheist. He's right for leaving Islam. Mm -hmm. And so that's good. But the, the sort of bigger picture involved here is there are lots of countries in the world that are entirely dominated and subjugated by Islam and uh, non-Muslims do not have the same rights as uh, as uh, Muslims. Uh, women don't have um, don't have anything remotely resembling uh, equal rights, and so 
uh, there needs to be there needs to come a change in these societies for even for even Christians to be free to to preach the gospel. But that change can can only come if you have enough people leaving Islam. You have enough people leaving Islam that there's now a, a kind of a, a plurality of people there enough to the extent that the government has to change and the government has to change and implement laws guaranteeing the rights of all people. And that kind of only happens if a bunch of people leave Islam. But, but guess what? If a bunch of people leave Islam and become atheists and a bunch of people leave Islam and they become Hindus and a bunch of people leave Islam and they become uh, Christians and so on, then if enough people leave Islam, period, you can get the kind of change that allows, allows people uh, more freedom and uh, respect for human rights and things like that. And so uh, if someone, uh, I, th- I think it's good. I think it's good when someone leaves Islam, even if they become an atheist, it's good that they, that they left Islam. Absolutely. Uh, I want to uh, make a quick comment, and then I want to look at uh, uh, kind of like oh, a yeah, comment we have tons also as of well. Comments here. Um, you know, one gentleman by the name Daniel was asking about how do you say God is here uh, in Hebrew. By the way, it is Elohim Khan. Elohim Khan. You know, that's the word how we say it. Now, um, the, the uh, uh, there is one person making comments saying, to be fair, if morality comes from God, then whatever he says is moral. If Allah is the true God, then his morals are morals. Now, I want to agree as a, as a former Muslim myself, of course, I used to think whatever Allah says goes. That's why you find a lot of uh, young, uh, actually, uh, fighters, fundamentalists, you know, who are willing to go to the extreme of even uh, killing themselves, uh, committing suicide, you know, uh, uh, bomb activities and other things. Why? Because they truly believe that's what God told them to do, the God of Islam. So there is something true about this statement, but would you like to add to that? Uh, yeah. Uh, so to be fair, if morality, I, I would agree, if morality actually came from Allah, then we would have to say, yep, I guess Allah just knows better than we do. I guess Allah just knows better than we do, and we should be going around uh, terrorizing the unbelievers and uh, beating wives into submission and taking uh, sex captives and things like that. Uh, so yes, if you actually did, but the, the, the idea is um, we are, we're looking at the claim, right? We're looking at the claim. We have, if, if we believe that certain things are objectively morally wrong, right? Now those are, we can, that's not the only evidence involved, but it's, it's some evidence. And when we see that Muhammad over and over again is doing things and promoting things that no one in history would regard as moral. No one, no one, no one outside of outside of that context would regard as a good idea or or a good thing to do. We would regard if we were to make a list of like the top ten worst things a person can do. Muhammad did like five or six of them, right? And so if if this guy's being set up as the pattern of conduct, you can't just say, "Well, God revealed it, therefore, therefore it's all okay." Whether God revealed it is part of the question. Right. That's, our, that's part of the question. Did God reveal it? Did God exactly. reveal it, right? What evidence do we have that God revealed it? And in Islam, we just find none, right? We find all kinds of claims about all this evidence. Oh, the scientific miracles and the perfect preservation of the Quran. But here's what's, what's interesting is, at the very least, Mah- the greatness of Muhammad and his great character are one of the main arguments that are put forward as evidence for Islam. So how do you know that this religion is true? Because Muhammad is the greatest man who ever lived. And we start looking into his life and he had sex with a nine-year-old girl. He took the, the wife of his own adopted son. Um, he had sex with his slave girls. He, he broke his oath to his wives. All he these allowed things. people to beat uh, their, uh, their wives and yeah. so on and so forth. So we find all these things. Muhammad uh, doing all these things or allowing all these things. And wait a minute, this Muhammad's character was supposed to be the evidence for Islam. So, uh, yeah, I have to have to respectfully disagree. You can't just say, well, uh, since Islam claims that God did it, therefore, you can, you know, you, right. if, if God commanded it, then then, yeah, the question is, did God command this stuff? Exactly. What evidence? And I would acknowledge that if you found if you had something right, like if, if let, let's suppose we were we were studying, you know, we were examining Islam. And let's suppose the only the only bad teaching in there was was that Muhammad had sex with a nine year old girl or something like that, right? And that was that was the only thing, and that really really bothered us. But imagine that there was great evidence for Islam. There's this amazing evidence for Islam. Well, if there was this amazing evidence for Islam, then we can imagine a situation where it would where it would outweigh 
our concerns, uh, you know, about the about the other issue. Problem is in Islam, there's just nothing like that. It's problems, problems, problems all the way down, and they never get to anything other than problems. Yeah, and I want to add. I mean, uh, in my own story, by the way, it was actually something that uh, opened my eyes to the reality that the God of Islam, Allah, cannot be a moral God, and here's why. I was basically uh, at a church uh, while I was seeking, and I heard him. Uh, it was September 11, actually, that weekend. They preached from the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus says, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecuted you. And here is the connection that I made. If Allah is the God of the Bible and Allah is the God of the Quran, then there is something wrong with these, uh, basically, statements because Allah in the Quran commanded me to hate basically my enemies yet 600 years earlier commanded me to love my enemies so there is some tension here that prompted me now to explore further why did he teach this back in the days of jesus and change his mind later and of course in the course of doing so realize that god cannot change god does not change his word god does not change his character that the cross represent it represents grace and love and so on and so forth so that in and of itself uh, reveal to me what you mentioned earlier that that cannot be the true God. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. Um, all right. So let's check out this comment. Um, uh, Anna said, uh, DJM said, you should treat other people how you would want to be treated. Why do you need to believe in God to believe in treating others as you as a person want to be treated? Now, notice when uh, when DJM says what we should do, he says, uh, he gives the golden rule, which was laid down by Jesus, right? Right, right, right. That you should do to others uh, what you would have them do to you. Now, notice what he said. Why do you need to believe in God to believe in treating others as a person, uh, as, as you would want to be treated? Notice, uh, notice the problem here, right? No one's saying you need to believe in God in order to believe that you should treat others as you would want to be treated. Right? There, there's, there's, you, 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 could, you could be a complete atheist and believe that you should treat others as you would want to be treated. In other words, you can be an atheist and, and follow the golden rule. The question is, why should you do that? Suppose you didn't want to. Suppose you didn't want to treat others the way you would want to be treated. Why do you have any sort of moral obligation to do that? We understand exactly. you can just do that. Exactly. We understand that you can just decide to do that. There is a moral compass that you're referring to. Where does it come from? Yeah, so in, in other words, if you're, if, you're, if you're talking to someone who says, well, I don't want to do that. I want to crush everyone in my path and dominate the entire world. Why is he wrong from your perspective? You say, well, I, I can believe that I should do. Yeah, you can, of course. You could, you could live like a frog if you wanted to, right? You, can, you could live like a frog. You can decide, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to live like a frog. I really like frogs. I'm going to live like a frog. I'm going to hop on down to uh, the lily pond. I'm going to sit on a lily pad and uh, I'm going to eat flies all day. You could do that. No one's saying you can't. So we're not talking about how you are capable of living. We understand you're capable of living like a frog. You're capable of living as, the, as a super nice person. You're capable of doing all this. Question is, why should you do that? Why should you live like a frog? Why should you live as a super nice person? Why should you? And given atheism, there's just no real reason. That, to be clear, once again, atheists, many atheists do live very good lives. Many atheists are very nice people. The question is, if you didn't want to do that, what basis is there in that worldview for saying you're wrong, right? What, what basis is there for saying that you're wrong? If you, like, just giving everyone an example. If you as an atheist were confronted with Jeffrey Dahmer, Jeffrey Dahmer was an atheist who killed and ate something like 17 people. If he said, you know, I don't care about treating other people how I want to be treated. I just want to eat them. I just want to eat people. I just want to cook and eat them. How do you convince that guy that he's wrong from your worldview, from your perspective? How do you do it? Um, you could notice anything you say, all you're doing is saying something, right? Anything you say, you're just saying, oh, you should be nice to other people. You, you ought not to, to eat them, but you're just, you're just saying words. There's nothing in your, I mean, suppose, in other words, suppose you were to say, what are you talking about? We eat, we eat cows, we eat cows, we eat chicken. Why shouldn't I eat a person, a human being? Well, because you're not allowed to do that. Notice you're already putting human beings in a different category. Why are you putting human beings in a different category uh, as an atheist? What's your, what's your basis for it? Um, you could say we're smarter. Well, we'll a cheetah's faster. What, what's your point? What's your point of saying that, that we're, we're more important in that way? Um, the, uh, I'm going to tell you, Al-Fadi, something has happened in history. Christians came along at some point, told everyone, we're created in the image of God. 
And before that, people would gladly trample all over each other, kill each other. I mean, if you look at the, 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 the Roman uh, gladiator contest, they love to watch human beings ripping each other apart. Right. The earliest complaint we have against Christians recorded in history, the complaint was that they refused to watch the gladiator contests. They refused to attend. And this was regarded as a huge insult to the entire state. The Christians didn't watch the gladiator contest because they didn't want to watch people who were created in the image of God ripped apart by animals or by each other. So they refused to attend, and this was actually a complaint against them. These, these Christians are bad. Um, back then, these gladiator contests, one of their favorite spectacles, they would get a massive animal like a bear. They would starve the animal, then put him, put him in, a, in, a, in, a, in, the, in the Colosseum with some people. That's right. Allow him to eat the people. And then they would kill the bear, cut the bear open, so that all the partially digested parts of human beings could come out. And the crowd would be cheering their, cheering their heads off at watching this. It was, a, it, was a, it was a favorite spectacle. Most people would be horrified, including atheists. Most people, including atheists, would look at that and go, I don't want to see that. I don't want to see Well, what changed? Why was that the favorite thing people could watch back then? To the, we didn't change biologically. How could that go from being the, the favorite thing anyone could want to watch to something that would horrify everyone, regardless of their worldview. Well, Christians spread an idea that we're all created in the image of God, that we have to love each other. Spread this idea so successfully that now non-Christians have the idea as right. well, that, that, right. that, that we all have to respect each other in, this, in, the, in these certain ways. Guys, keep in mind, these ideas that you have, these values that you have, these values that we all have, they didn't come out of nowhere. Right? They, 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 didn't, they didn't appear by magic. You, you go back in history, people would do some very, very horrible things to each other without thinking twice about them. And we know things changed over time, and we know why they changed. And so if you now throw out the worldview that caused the change, you can do that. There's nothing stopping you. But if you want to retain the beliefs of that worldview, how do you now then justify it, especially if you have a completely different worldview that, that can't account for them? So uh, anyway, that's, that, that, that's kind of the series that we've been working on. We're trying to draw these issues to the surface, and we're interested in discussing uh, moral issues and moral arguments. And, and for those of you who've been watching, you know, um, <clears throat> this, isn't, this isn't me just uh, being a jerk, <laughs> talking about atheism, went around here, kind of setting the stage because I'm about to have a, a debate with the apostate prophet on uh, morality, um, you know, atheism and, and God, atheism and morality, and also having a debate with Matt Dillahunty, I believe, on Monday. So... Matt's an, Matt's an atheist. We're going to be discussing sort of uh, God versus secular, uh, secular humanism and, and account as, as far as a foundation for morality. So everything I'm saying here, guess what? I'm going to be, I'm going to be talking about this stuff with uh, actual atheists. So stay tuned for that. All right. Got yeah. some questions you want to answer? Well, I want to just comment on uh, uh, there is Omar Ghani uh, uh, said uh, basically um, something to the extent <clears throat> that uh, somebody has to read the Quran uh, in its context to understand uh, basically why the Quran, for instance, is talking about warfare. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, Omar, let me ask you this question, if you would like to elaborate. What was the context, basically, that the Quran commanded people in chapter 9, verse 29, to fight, persecute, oppress, even to the point of killing Christians and Jews? Please tell me. What was it? Yeah, Omar, I, I triple dog dare you to t give us the context of Surah 9, verse 29, because I know the context, like the back of my hand here. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's talk is cheap, by the way, and I, I get it that you're embarrassed, you know, these days. And uh, you, you probably, I want to have to tell you this, using moral argument, your moral arguments are much better than the author of the Quran, actually. Because you're trying to justify why would the Quran command someone to fight and oppress and hate when in fact you feel like this is something wrong, so you have to come up with the excuse of context. Now show me please any clerk in Saudi or at Al-Azhar in Egypt or even in Iran that would agree with you. Just show me, anyone. Um, you're getting lots of comments on uh, your dope set here. Yeah, uh, we, uh, we spend a lot of uh, money on it. That's why we brought David, so we can raise that money that we spent it already. Mike AD said, Fadi has an amazing setup. And I keep saying uh, the, the beautiful setup and the beautiful everything. Yeah, yeah, just so you know, um, planning on building a studio about a year from now. Now, I'm going to bring these guys down to the guys who put this studio together. I'm going to I'm gonna get them to go ahead and put something together for me. Well, you got a response from... Uh, 
Gani. <laughs> Omar. <laughs> Omar says, you read that same chapter in verses 5 through 10. Oh, my goodness. Up, oh, You did it. You did it, oh, Omar. My. You want, you you want it, Omar. verse 5? I can't believe <laughs> you, you it, bring verse 5 I into can't believe this. he said that refers to Jews and Christians. That's shocking. <laughs> wow. Wow, 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 And I wow, asked wow. you about verse 29. Why would you have to embarrass yourself and talk about a whole totally different thing right now also in the context itself that you're referring to? Anyway, brother, go ahead. You know, I guess uh, Omar uh, really needs some entertainment right now. I guess Omar right now. Uh, made it easy. Now, notice, guys, notice. Omar makes a claim. We, we, we keep saying the same thing over and over, right? Er, er, again, earlier, <laughs> earlier we're, we're live on Al Fadi's channel. And I was saying, I was saying, notice the Muslims who are coming and commenting, they don't know what they're talking about in the Bible, and they don't know what they're talking about in the Quran, yet they keep talking. Instead of sitting back and studying first, why does that, it, it never crosses my mind to talk about something unless I sit back and study first. In Islam, the, the, the rule seems to be completely reversed. Make sure you know absolutely nothing about a topic and then, and then talk about it endlessly. That seems to be the rule, does it not? Exactly. So earlier, earlier we, were, we, were, we were in there with Muslims. And, and did you see them say one thing that was correct? Absolutely not. In fact, we were talking about atheism, moral values, and somebody was talking about the Trinity. Yeah, and uh, and so and then we had, uh, <laughs> and then of course there was the uh, uh, a Muslim telling us that there were four hundred gospels about Jesus, four hundred years, four hundred BC. I said, do you know what BC means? Do you know, BC means before Christ. You're saying there were four hundred gospels, four hundred BC. That's exactly what I was saying. And he said it, he eventually, by the time he it got to the time of Jesus, got narrowed down to the four gospels that we have now. Now that is so insane. You would wonder how, how someone could pass second grade with, with that sort of reasoning. And yet this is just, it was just everything we were hearing. Um, but here we have, here we have uh, Omar saying that <laughs> it was, it was the Christians and Jews who broke faith. Uh, Omar, um, I don't, there are two possibilities here, Omar. You, you tell us which one. Either you've never read Surah 9 or you're lying. Which one? Those are two possibilities. Either you haven't read Surah 9, in which case maybe you're speaking out of ignorance. In other words, you don't know what you're talking about and you looked up something on the internet and you gave it as a response. Either that's the case or you you have read Surah 9, you know what it actually says and you know we're lying. You know you're lying. I have to tell him this, uh, my brother here. The age of claiming that there are Westerners that probably don't know Arabic is over. <clears throat> Not only David knows the Arabic of the Quran better than you and the commentaries, but I am an Arab as well from Saudi Arabia and an ex-Muslim. So please don't joke with us right now. Get serious. <clears throat> All right. Now let's go through this, ladies and gentlemen. Let's go ahead and re read through this. You ready? All right. So we'll start at verse 1. Freedom from all obligations is declared from Allah and his messenger to those of the mushrikun, polytheists, pagans, idolaters, disbelievers in the oneness of Allah, with whom you made a treaty. Who, who did Muhammad make a treaty with? Was this a treaty with the Jews or Christians, or was this a treaty with the pagans? Yeah. Omar, this, the entire beginning of this chapter is talking about Muhammad's agreements with the pagans. With the pagans, not with the, not with the Jews and the Christians. So Muhammad conquered Mecca. Then he made an agreement with them that allowed them to continue on. And then he got a revelation. He got a revelation as he, he often did. And his revelation, his revelation said that now you have immunity from that agreement. So let's go ahead. Um, I'll go ahead and read Shakir. This is a declaration of immunity by Allah and his apostle towards those of the idolaters with whom you made an agreement. So go about the land for four months and know that you cannot weaken Allah and that Allah will bring disgrace to the unbelievers. And an announcement from Allah and his apostle to the people on the day of the greater pilgrimage. Wait a minute, the pilgrimage? Were Jews and Christians taking the pilgrimage to Mecca? I mean, I'm telling you, man, the, the, these, these jokers don't have a clue what they're talking about. <clears throat> mm -hmm. An announcement from Allah and his apostle to the people on the day of the greater pilgrimage that Allah and his apostle are free from liability to the idolaters. Therefore, if you repent, it will be better for you. And if you turn back, then know that you will not weaken Allah and announce painful punishment to those who disbelieve. Verse 4. Except those of the idolaters with whom you made an agreement, then they have not failed you in anything and have not backed up anyone against you. So fulfill their agreement to the end of the term. Surely Allah loves those who are careful of their duty. You, you hear anything about Jews and Christians yet? I mean... 
Muhammad sent Ali to the people of Mecca, warning them not to go and perform pil pilgrimage naked anymore, and they have four months, basically. Yeah, we know this is exactly what this is talking about. This is talking about the pagan polytheist exactly. of Mecca. Exactly. That's who yeah. all of this is about here, yeah. right? Uh, and then you get to verse 5. So when the sacred months have passed away, then slay the idolaters wherever you find them and take them captives and besiege them and lie in wait for them in every ambush. Then if they repent and keep up prayer and pay the poor rate, leave their way free to them. Surely Allah is forgiving and merciful. Now, according to the Muslim sources, there then arose a, uh, so th th there's, there's this problem though. If you say slay the idolaters wherever you find them, how do you, um, what do you, what do you do if someone's just bring like a messenger, like a pagan messenger? There are people who are going to kill him. You yep. know what I mean, there are messenger. If, if someone comes as a messenger to carry a message and he's a pagan, you're going to kill him, right? Because it says slay the idolaters wherever you find them. Uh, or if someone is coming to learn about Islam, what if someone comes to a Muslim land? He says, "Hey, I'm a you know I'm a Hindu. I want to learn about Islam. Could you tell me about Islam? You don't kill him because he's a Hindu, right? You don't jump on him because he's a Hindu." Uh, you, so the, the, the issue there became, well, we can't slay everyone. We need to clarify that <clears throat> in certain situations, you don't kill them. So let's keep yeah. going. Yeah. Surah 9, verse 6. And if one of the idolaters seek protection from you, seek protection. So a messenger says, hey, I need protection or, a, uh, or someone who wants to hear the word of Allah. And if one of the idolaters seek protection from you, grant him protection till he hears the word of Allah, then make him attain his place of safety. This is because they are a people who do not know. So it's giving a qualification. Hey, when I say slay the idolaters wherever you find them, there are exceptions to that. If someone's a messenger, if someone is here to, to listen to the word of Allah, you don't, you don't slaughter him then. Um, and, and then we get down to verse seven. How can there be an agreement for the idolaters with Allah and with his apostle, except those with whom you made an agreement at the sacred mosque? Did Muhammad make a, an agreement with Jews and Christians at the sacred mosque? No. No, there was no agreement. That was with pagans. That in, was with in, the polytheists of Mecca. his agreement with the Jews was in Medina, and that's why he claimed that they violated that <clears throat> and ended up annihilating them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how can there be an agreement for the idolaters with Allah and with his apostle, except those with whom you made an agreement at the sacred mosque? So long as they are true to you, be true to them. Surely Allah loves those who are careful of their duty. So there is not one word in here about this applying to Jews and to Christians. Not one word in here about this applying to Jews and Christians it has nothing to do with it. Historically, we know what exactly what this is about. This is about Muhammad and the pagans of Mecca. And yet, when you ask a simple question, Surah 9, verse 29, why does Allah say, why does Allah command uh, Muslims to fight Jews and Christians until we acknowledge our inferiority and pay the jizya, pay Muslims money to avoid being killed? Why is that? And Umar, again, either he has no clue what he's talking about, Either he has no clue what he's talking about. He looked it up on a website, in which case he's ignorant and should should not be commenting. He should be studying or he knows that this is about pagans, but he tried to deceive everyone over in the chat, hoping that we wouldn't expose him. Exactly. So it's one of those, right? Absolutely. And by the way, uh, there is something interesting. When you started reading, I did not hear you use the Bismillah. Bismillah, Rahman, mm -hmm. Rahim. Where is it in it's, chapter it, nine? They forgot it there. Why? They forgot it in this one. Do you know the reasons why they, they didn't mention the Besmala in there? Uh, I've, heard a couple, I've heard a couple theories, but do, do you have one that you actually prefer? Oh, yeah, of course. I mean, it says like this is not a chapter of peace or security. So you wouldn't start by saying in the name of Allah, the most merciful, the most compassionate, mm. because it's a chapter of terror in the heart of the unbelievers. That includes Christians and Jews, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so th are you saying that was only back then, 14 centuries ago, that this uh, chapter doesn't apply anymore? So why do you have it in the Quran then? What about chapter uh, uh, Surah 5? Uh, how, how many verses did it abrogate, Surah 5? And now, now our friend uh, asking you to read now uh, verses 12 to 14, actually. So now he shifted <clears throat> the uh, goalpost. Okay, we can go down to 12 to 14. Um, why, are we, why are we reading 12 to 14? We still haven't gotten to uh, uh, Because uh, he wants us to distract playing the usual game, you know, distraction. That's all. That's fine. We're, we're, we're generous with our time. Are we not merciful? Amen to that, bro. Uh, let me pull it up. All right, what did he want? Uh, he's giving you like a context and saying, you know, if they the, basically... Wait, this, this still, it's not, until, it's not until you get to verse 28 that it's talking about Jews and Christians. Exactly, right? exactly. <clears throat> so everything here deals with the pagan Arabs. Okay, so um, what, are, what are we looking at? What verses? 
Did you say 12 uh, to 13? He said 12 to 14. Okay, 12 to 14. Yeah. All right. And if they break their oaths after their agreement and openly revile your religion, notice how, notice how they're breaking the oath. Reviling the religion. That means assaulting. That means insulting a religion, right? Exactly. So, so if people insult your religion... And if they break their oaths after their agreement and openly revile your religion, then fight the leaders of unbelief. Surely their oaths are nothing so that they may desist. Now, now, who, in context, we just read it. Who, who, who's this talking about? It's talking about the pagans, right? It's talking about the pagans of Mecca. Okay. Verse 13. What? Will you not fight a people who broke their oaths and aimed at the expulsion of the apostle? Who's that? The people of Mecca. And they attacked you first. Do you fear them? But Allah is most deserving that you should fear him if you are believers. Still not reading one word about Jews and Christians, Omar. Uh, verse 14. Fight them. Allah will punish them by your hands and bring them to disgrace and assist you against them and heal the hearts of a believing people. Omar, he asked you a very, very simple question. The question was, why is there a command to fight Jews and Christians and to subjugate, violently subjugate Jews and Christians, forcing them to pay money in verse 929? And all you're talking about is, but look at what happened with the pagans, the polytheists. Are, 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 you, are you, Omar, are you telling me that if I'm walking down the street and some pagans come up and do something to me, I say, oh man, some pagans went around messing with me. Let me go kill a bunch of Jews and Christians until they pay me money. Is that your logic? Is that your reasoning here? Because that's what you're telling us is, is Allah's reasoning. Oh man. The people of Mecca treated Muhammad really, really poorly, even though, even though they treated him way better than I would be treated in Mecca today. I mean, can you, can you imagine this? The, uh, Muslims come, and uh, in the Quran here, they're complaining about the way the Meccans treated Muhammad. Yeah. Muhammad preached openly for more than a decade yeah. in um, Mecca. Would I, last, would I last a decade if I started preaching against the religious beliefs of the people of Mecca? today. Do you, I think mean, I, do you think I'd last 10 years? You won't last even 10 seconds. I would last 10 seconds if I went where Muhammad went and started preaching against the religious beliefs of the people of Mecca today. And yet Muslims will say, yeah, they, you know, Muhammad, he preached there for more than a decade. But, you know, gosh, they were, you know, they were, they were mean to him. They, you know, threw some stuff at him and stuff like that. I, this is, I would be beaten to death in a heartbeat there for saying anything. But notice the Muslims will say, look, the, the Meccans were so intolerant. But the Muslims today are so tolerant. It's, yeah, a, it's like... That's it's exactly weird. his point right here. He's asking another uh, one of those funny questions, of course. Omar? He's saying, oh yeah, Omar, you know, our friend. Well, well, I mean, first, I mean, first, and until he explains himself, he needs to... He's saying, you know, how come, uh, you know, non-Muslims who are living like in Saudi, Qatar, Kuwait, uh, are not being fought by Muslims? Have you heard of something called demitude? It seems to me like you have no clue what you're talking about. There is a Sharia mandate called demitude. If a non-believer is willing to live in an Islamic country under the leadership of the Islamic government, obeying their rules, then they won't be fought. They won't be fought at all. But they have to ab uh, abide uh, by the rules, including, by the way, you cannot have Bible studies. Huh, that's There goes the freedom of religion. You cannot really be caught celebrating Christmas. There goes the freedom of religion. You cannot, as an unbeliever, marry a Muslim woman, even though the Quran never said that. There goes the freedom of religion. Anyway. Yeah, um, I don't know what, I don't know if we're supposed to take uh, Omar seriously. Um, I wouldn't. Uh, he's got a comment. He's got, oh, he says, uh, can I ask a question? If we Muslims were allowed to kill non-Muslims for the sake of Allah, then why is it that non-Muslims in Arab countries like uh, Qatar Emirates, uh, Kuwait, and Jordan are fine? Uh, well, uh, Omar, um, to be clear, you're not you're not supposed to kill all unbelievers. You're supposed to violently subjugate them until they're second class citizens and so on, um, which is historically what happened. That's why you ended up with Christian communities, right? That's why you ended up with Christian communities in Muslim lands. They were subjugated and forced to pay the jizya, and they were allowed to continue. As far as now, now there now you have countries that are uh, under certain uh, human rights laws and stuff like that, right? Um, so now you have different kinds of laws, but it's it's kind of the same reason. Like, wh why do you have, um, why do you have uh, minimum ages for marriage in Muslim countries when, according to the Quran, you can marry prepubescent girls and have sex with them? N notice, notice what you're saying. If the Quran really said that you can have sex with a prepubescent girl, why isn't that the law in every Muslim land? Well, you, you, what's your what's your what's your silly assumption there? Your silly assumption is that all Muslim countries completely follow 
what Islam teaches, and they don't. They just don't. I, I'll, I'll go ahead and say this. The vast majority of Muslims live far better lives than their religion calls them to live, right? You probably live a far better, even though you're sitting here lying after lying after lying after lying after lying, you're still living a far, far better life than your religion calls you to live. And so it, it just doesn't make, notice you, you could do the reverse, right? If Jesus said we need to uh, love our enemies, why are there Christians who aren't loving? Well, what would the assumption there be? The, sum, the assumption would be everyone who follows a religion follows everything in that religion. It's right. not. It, Christians, we fall massively short of what our religion teaches. Muslims live far better and far beyond what their religion teaches. So that's what happens when you have religions that teach very different things. But brother, as I mentioned, I mean, they, they, they have to live in subjugation. In fact, that's why he's evading chapter uh, verse 29, because it says they have to pay the jizya uh, with willing submission. Mm -hmm. That includes, by the way, surrendering a lot of things. I mean, maybe they're not paying physically money. I would argue they are being basically, uh, you know, used uh, for monetary purposes by certain people. But nevertheless, uh, you know, we're thankful that the governments of these uh, countries actually are not killing them. But I mentioned to you, do they have freedom of religion? Can they do anything without the government approving? So how can you say that basically they're safe? They're safe based on what? Um, so uh, let's go ahead and find some other comments here. Uh, Omar doesn't seem to. Uh, has he made one accurate comment yet? Uh, no, I think we need to just uh, start looking at some serious people asking <laughs> questions. Although every time I say that, they, every time I, every time I try to get out, they pull me back in. Yeah, in I other know. words, we're going to try I and know. focus on some other people, but I know Omar is going to say something so silly that I just end up uh, not being able to resist. Yeah. So let's see if anyone, uh, somebody's saying, can you explain the difference between ministering to Sunnis and Shia and any tips regarding Shias? You know, I mean, I, I don't want to sit here and do a lecture on that, but nevertheless, uh, Sunnis and Shia differ in certain doctrines. For instance, you know, I'll give you just quickly uh, the, the Sunnis, of course, do not believe that you can go to the grave of the Prophet or others and just pray and ask him to intercede on your behalf, technically speaking, in general. At least the fundamentalist, you know, the literalist Muslims do not believe in something like this. Shia will allow you to go and perform a pilgrimage, actually, to Ali, Hassan, Hussein, and many of these imams, basically. And they believe they can intercede on your behalf. So right there, uh, Jesus is uh, becomes relevant to them because, hey, he's our intercessor. Uh, you, you don't see Sunnis, but, uh, for instance, in Muharram, you know, the, the first month in the Islamic calendar, walking in the streets, uh, you know, f uh, flagging themselves, bleeding themselves, uh, basically mourning uh, the death of uh, Hussein, basically the, uh, the son of Ali, the grandson of Muhammad, and lamenting uh, that they let him down at the same time in hope that this bleeding can uh, atone for their sins. Jesus shed his blood for basically our sins. So, so you can see some, uh, some things that you can use to build a bridge into the gospel. And I mean, there are different approaches with the Sunnis, of course. With the Sunnis, they are into religion. Uh, most of the time, uh, talking about the Pharisees and religion and things like that, you can show that Jesus is anti, basically, religious establishment. He came to restore a relationship for. So you have to really look at the context and look at the person, and every person will vary. Some Shia are very fundamentalist. Others are nominal. And the same thing with the Sunnis. Um, question for you, or both of us, uh, should Christians wish Muslims Eid Mubarak? You know, um, I struggle with these kind of things. Uh, from my personal view, if I wish someone uh, basically a, uh, anything related to their own rituals, it's all, it could give them the impression that I'm okay with that. I'd rather just to use their phrase and say, oh, what do you mean by that? What is this celebration? Why is it, you know, and try to find a uh, something basically to connect us with them. I don't, you know, I'm, personally, I don't see any biblical foundation for trying to at least appease uh, someone who is, in this case, does not really follow uh, the God that I follow or even celebrate something that the Bible uh, condone as a righteous celebration. What do you have to say? Uh, yeah, I don't have any. I don't have any strong feelings uh, either way. If if yeah. uh, if a Christian said that, you know, to be nice, it's not saying, hey, I affirm your your religion or or 
anything. I think a Muslim would understand, hey, this, you know, this Christian's just trying to, it's like, it's like if a Muslim says Merry Christmas, I understand you don't, re you don't really believe, right. you don't really believe these things and so on. But at the same time, I never understand this, this desire to get everyone to affirm each other's holidays. Like, if you're a Muslim, why would you want to say Merry Christmas? It's not bothering me that you don't. I understand we have different religious beliefs. That's I don't right. care. I don't, you, don't, you, don't, right. you don't have to say it. Yeah. Say, say, how's it going or something like that. Say, say hi. So, um, yeah, not, some, not something I'm going to be saying, but it's not something I'd be, I'd be upset with a Christian for, uh, for saying. Um, right. we, have, uh, we have up on the pull, our, our, uh, our tech guys have pulled up on the screen. Uh, can an ex-Muslim believe in Jesus' story from the gospel account but have no desire of being uh, a Christian? So can an ex-Muslim believe in the Jesus story from the gospel account but have no desire of being a Christian? Christian, I would say, if, if you mean, if you just mean, can you? Yeah, you could, you can believe anything you want exactly. about, about anything, right? You, yeah. Exactly. I mean, uh, I mean, uh, some people will believe it. Some people will not believe it. But the idea, whether you believe it or not, is not going to make a difference. As long as you don't believe in Christ, then you have no hope of making it to heaven. But if you believe in Christ, who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father except by me. Only then you can make it to heaven. But to say I believe it or don't believe it, it makes no difference whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Jesus many times says, you know, why do you call me Lord, Lord? Uh, because you haven't done the will of my Father. So the will of the Father is to send the Son to die for our sin. And we ought to basically accept that gift that was given to us. That's why it's called grace. So, Yeah, and uh, now the, the, the weird part, the weird part about the question that I see is, uh, it's can you believe in the Jesus story from the gospel account but have no desire of being a Christian. Um, it's weird to say you would believe the Jesus story, but not want to be a Christian, right? It's one thing to say, I don't believe the Jesus story. You right, know, I, I read you're stuff affirming and I, everything and, that happened. Yeah, and then. I don't believe that it happened. Yeah. But if you read the Gospels and you actually believe that in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and, you know, Jesus... He performs all these miracles, and he announces that he's going to lay down his life for others. And then he goes and he dies on the cross for sins, and he rises from the dead, and he's claimed all along that, that he's Lord. To say that you believe that, that you believe the story, but don't want to be a Christian, that would, that would be confusing. Because it would almost seem like if you believe it, but you say you're not, you're not going to become a Christian anyway, it's, it would seem like open rebellion, right? I mean, notice that would be like me saying, if I believe that Muhammad is a prophet and I believe that he got these revelations and I believe that, um, but I'm not going to believe in Islam. That's weird to me, right? If I, obviously, if I believed, if I believed that he's a true prophet, I would have to say, well, well, guess I'm wrong about, you know, everything I've been saying about him. He's a true prophet. Um, so yeah, I'm a little confused by the, uh, by the question here. Yeah. Um, I did see someone is asking a funny question. And saying, uh, when did the Christians and the Jews uh, change their scripture? What do you mean, change our scripture? <laughs> Who said that? Was the, it a Muslim? The Christians and the Jews that don't get along in terms of believing in the same thing somehow managed to get together, change the scripture, to agree with each other, and they both shook hands and said, hey, man, that's great. Now we are going definitely yeah. uh, to be one team against Islam and Muhammad. Yeah. What an amazing, amazing miracle, really. That is. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I tell you what, my friend, why don't you see and check if any Muslim have done a PhD study on that? That will be interesting. Um, all right. We have a we have a comment from Omar. <laughs> I told you. I told you. See, every time I think oh, I'm not going to pay attention to this guy anymore. I even told you I said ahead of time he's going to say something so dumb that he's going to pull me back in. Uh, so Omar worry. here says, I still find it very odd how Christians believe that God lived in the womb for nine months and grew up and got killed by his own creation. Couple of things here. I'm not going to say a word right now. One, Omar has no concept of a God who loves us enough to do something like that. Right? Omar, in, in, in Islam, and Omar has no concept of a God whose justice is so perfect that he demands that all sin must be punished. Right? So that if he's going to, even if he's going to forgive people, there must still be punishment, and he, he takes it upon himself, right? Right. Um, so Omar has no concept of a God who is perfect in love, and Omar has no concept of a God who's perfect in justice, right? Allah, the, Islam solves the problem of what, you call this the problem of human sin, 
right? If you have a God who's perfect in justice and he's perfect in love and mercy, what does that sort of God do if he's confronted by humans, human beings who are sinners? Well, his love, would be, his love and mercy would be saying, well, forgive them. His justice would be saying, no, punish them. You have to punish them. How, what are we going to do here? Well, the solution in Islam is to show that God isn't really all that just. He can just let sin slide. And he's not really all that loving. He has no love for unbelievers. He has no love for all kinds of people in the Quran. He has no love for the proud, no love for all kinds of people. So the solution to this problem in Islam is to make a defective God, a defective, right. weak God who's flawed in his attributes, right? Christianity is a bit different. Christianity wants to, wants to still affirm that God is perfect in justice, meaning that every sin, by the end, every sin will have been punished. But Christianity also wants to proclaim that God is also perfect in his love and mercy. Well, how does the God of Christianity deal with, how does the God of Christianity deal with the problem of being confronted by human sinners? Well, his forgiveness calls on him to forgive, and but even those people whose sins are being forgiven, he still pays that penalty. How does he do that? Well, he enters creation as Jesus of Nazareth. So notice part two here. Uh, Omar finds it odd that Christians believe that God would live in a womb for nine months. What do we find in Surah 27 verses seven through nine? Moses sees a fire. He goes over and says, hey, I want to find out what's going on with this fire over here. Moses goes over to the fire and then a voice comes out of the fire. Blessed is he who's in the fire and he who's around the fire. Moses, I am Allah. So who's in the fire? Allah. Wait a minute. Let me get this straight, Omar. It's silly and illogical. It's silly and illogical for, for God to enter into creation and be in a womb, but it makes perfect sense for God to be in a fire. That's right. Wait, which is greater? Which is greater? A, a human being or a fire? Which one's greater? So, so I, I, I don't know what to do with these guys, El Fadi, right? These are, these are guys who will say, ha, it makes no sense. It's funny. It's hilarious for God to be in a womb. Even though there's a very good reason for it, right? There's a very good theological reason for it. Um, but it makes perfect sense for God to be in a fire. That, that makes perfect sense. We're, we're, we're Muslims. Makes perfect sense. No problem for God to be in a fire. What is this religion? And grew up and got killed by his own creation. It says he laid down his life willingly. It was willing. Omar, what have you what have you said that you have not got schooled on? Have you seen him not get schooled on something? All right, let's yeah. take some more so, comments. So let me let me uh, add just one more thing mm -hmm, mm -hmm. for the benefit of everybody. Uh, Omar asked a typical question our Muslim friends typically ask. You know, how can you believe in God in a God who died? Please show me. Where did the scripture say God in his nature, in his essence, God is a spirit, died? Just show me that verse. Let me remind you, Omar and others who are asking this kind of question. 1 Peter 3.18 reads the following, and this is the NIV translation, for instance. It says, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. Did you get it? The body died, not the spirit, the nature died. Even Islam teaches this, by the way, at least talks about the martyrs. Don't, uh, you know, don't basically count those who died in the cause of Allah dead, but alive. If a human being can be alive after they're dead, are you telling me God cannot do something like this? I mean, it's, it's a strange thing, really, you know? Um... Mamadou Salou, uh, Salou Bari said, how can Jesus be fully man and fully God? Um, yeah, this is just a, a misunderstanding uh, among Muslims. They hear fully this and fully that, and they think, oh, you, how is that possible? When we say fully man and fully God, the, the, the phrase is meant, to su is meant to suggest that there's, it's not a mixture that, that dilutes the natures, right? In other, words, in other words, if I take a glass of milk and a glass of orange juice and I mix them together, I get something that's not milk and not orange juice, right? It's something in between. It's some weird hybrid. But if I take a glass of milk and a glass of orange juice and I put them together, well, I still have a glass of milk and a glass of orange juice. They're just together, right? So the idea of saying that Jesus is fully God and fully man, it means that you take a human nature and a divine nature and combine them and you get a dual nature, a dual nature, right? 
So now they have a dual nature. And what that means is he's not, he's not half human. He's not a quarter human. He's not an eighth human. He is fully human, meaning he has what a human being has, right? He has a full human body. He, he's, he's a human being, right? So that's what, that's what that means. Um, notice, uh, notice this, the parallel in Islam is, is the Quran, right? Yeah. So the parallel in Islam is the Quran. The Quran is supposedly the eternal speech of Allah. Uh, as such, it's incorruptible, has no beginning, can't be changed and so on. But the Quran in, in our world is a, is a physical book. It's, it's a book. So how can the Quran, so is the Quran fully the speech of Allah? A Muslim is supposed to say, yes, the Quran is fully the speech of Allah. Is, if I have a copy of the Quran, is the Quran fully a book? Yeah, the Quran's fully a book. I mean, it has, it has pages. It has, it's made of paper and glue and ink. It's printed on there. Yeah, it's fully a book. It's, it's a book. I couldn't tell the difference between that and, and any other book, except it's worse, much worse written. Um, so that's, that's what that would mean. I hope that, uh, hope that clarifies things for yeah. you. Let me give a scriptural basis as to why the scripture tells us that Jesus is fully man and fully God. You know, for instance, in John 1, 14, where Muslims, by the way, according to the Quran, in chapter 4, verse 171, believe that Jesus is the word of God, basically, that was casted into Mary and born as what? A person. His name is Christ, uh, Jesus uh, or the Messiah, uh, Jesus, son of Mary. I mean, how, how does that work? The word of God into Mary, born as a child, a, a male has a name. I mean, you tell me, explain that to me. Our scripture said this, actually. Muhammad just borrowed it from there. It says, and the word became flesh. Who is the word? In John 1, 1, it says, in the beginning, the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And then in verse 14, it says, and the word became flesh. What does that mean? He was born. In Isaiah 9, 6, it says, a child is born, a son is given to us. Notice the pre-existence of Christ. Even Jesus himself says, before Abraham was, I am. In other words, I predated basically the existence of Abraham. Uh, you know, I, I can go on and on and on with the, these references. But, uh, you know, if somebody wants to really search for the truth with an open mind and an open heart, then you will find support for these kind of questions. But to come in just with reason and saying reason is more uh, superior to what the scripture, the word of God is teaching is almost like the unpardonable sin because you are really throwing the truth in the face of the Holy Spirit who inspired the writers of the Bible. Um, <clears throat> now, now we have the mocking going on. Dear Dad says, fully man and fully God. Ha, 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 ha. That's like saying this square is fully square and fully circle. So he's saying it's a contradiction which doesn't make any sense. Wow. Um, and you, you, actually, you actually had, uh, had the perfect response uh, a couple comments later from Diana, who says, to be fully something does not mean to be exclusively something, right? So to be fully man does not, ex does not mean that's, that's all you are. You could be something in addition to that. You could be fully yeah. man and fully president, right? Um, yeah. But again, but notice if, if dear dad is, is, is laughing at that, he just destroyed his own Quran, right? Because Christians believe in the, what's called the dual nature of Christ, the dual nature of Christ. But Muslims believe in the dual nature. They don't know this because their leaders don't tell them this, but they believe in the dual nature of the Quran. That the Quran is, and is, the, is simultaneously the eternal speech of Allah, but also a book in our world made of paper and glue and ink. Yeah. So if, if you can't be fully a book and fully the divine word of Allah, then if it makes no sense, if that's like saying that this, you know, this is a square circle, then great. Islamic theology regarding the Quran is completely false. And dear dad, just exposed the Quran as a false book and Muhammad as a false prophet for, uh, for proclaiming yeah. it. And let me, let me just add this. Uh, please explain to me, sir, mm -hmm. um, in the Quran, uh, when it says that Jesus created from mud, basically, in the shape of birds and breathed life into it. Now, I know what you're going to say. You're going to say, oh, by the will of Allah. Please tell me, where did it say, by the power of Allah? It says, by the will of Allah. So, I am going to give David right now the will, the permission, to go ahead and show his powers. I'm going to say, okay, you know, I'm fine with it. Go ahead and show it. I didn't say, I'm going to give you my power to be able to do this. The Quran itself acknowledges that Jesus is divine. Like it or not, I'm sorry, you know? I mean, I don't know why we dance around these kind of uh, realities. The author of the Quran copied and pasted without thinking. No, no wonder, you know, we get these kind of questions. <clears throat> All right. By the way, how long are we uh, going here? We have a... Uh, we can go for another five, to, ten minutes maybe and we'll start to, wrapping uh, it up right now. Yeah, we have close to 1,100 here. All right. Um, 
That's some comments there. We have a question right here for me, I think. What is some Saudi culture uh, we could learn from in the West, Al Fadi? Yeah. Uh, nice hat. Thanks, man. Uh, I appreciate that. I mean, I'm not so sure really uh, what do you mean by learning about here. I mean, uh, by the way, I do training in terms of reaching the Saudi students uh, all the time, and I do talk, talk about culture. So, uh, I mean, uh, the Saudi culture varies, by the way, depending where the person came from, uh, which region in Saudi. But in general, there are certain things about the Saudi culture, you know, the way they dress, the way they uh, uh, congregate to each other, the way they respect, you know, authority and so on and so forth. So there is so much. If you will, if you would like, with your permission, you know, you can always contact me directly through my website, SyriaInternational.com, and I'll be more than happy to find ways to share that kind of information with you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I have a comment from, whoop, where did it go? It was raptured. Oh, there we go. Uh, Turb said, um, is this a good argument? We can't imagine anything greater than God. But when we look at Allah, we can imagine a more loving and just God than Allah that's greater. Therefore, Islam is false. Uh, yeah, and that's, that's, uh, that's very similar. That's very similar uh, to uh, points, points I raise uh, over the years. Namely that it, it's sort of a classic becomes very difficult to define God. So one of the classic definitions of God is he's a being than which a greater cannot be conceived, right? So he's not even saying that God is the greatest conceivable being because that would be to grant that you can actually get your mind around God, right? Just saying that God is, is such that you can't conceive of something greater. So if you ever think you understand God, uh, uh, God, and you can think of something greater, you're not, you're not really thinking about, about God. But uh, as Turb points out, um, you can easily, easily, easily think of a, of a God greater than Allah. Now notice, people will say, oh, but the God that's ever occurred will be punished, right? Um, so that's, the justice is perfect. You can't, be mo you can't be more just than that. If you're talking about his love, he entered creation to take our penalty upon himself. I don't see how you can get more loving than that. That's the most loving thing ever, right? So I don't see how you could, how you could even conceive of something that's, that's, that's greater than that. Uh, in Islam, I mean, Allah doesn't love all kinds of people. He just sweeps lots of sin under the rug. Uh, eventually it became a problem in Islam. You know what I'm talking about. Eventually it became a problem of Muslims are coming and saying, hey, Muhammad, you know, you keep talking about a, uh, you keep talking about Allah saying that he could just forgive our sins and sweep them under the rug because he's not all that just. But I got a problem, man. I've, I've committed a lot of sins here. I've got sins as heavy as a mountain. That's when Muhammad had to modify things a bit. And he told his followers that if you have sins as heavy as a mountain, in other words, so much sin that, that Allah is just not going to, he's not just going to, he's not just going to let that, let that slide. Allah takes your mountain of sins and puts them on Jews and Christians and makes Jews and Christians punish, uh, be punished for your sins. That's what the great God Allah does. So uh, you, have, you have Allah's, uh, Allah's love and justice and mercy. It's all just massively defective. And so, yeah, since, he, since we can easily, easily conceive of a God greater than Allah, clear that he just isn't... Uh, isn't God. Now, by the way, just so you know, what Muslims what Muslim uh, Muslims do here, they'll say who says that a, who says that God is a being is a being than which a greater cannot be conceived. So, who who says that or who says that God is the greatest conceivable being? Who says that? So, they'll they'll, they'll just bite the bullet and say, "Yeah, uh, uh, we just reject your definition of God." So, Allah, I mean, God can be massively defective and inferior. And you could easily imagine beings that are massively greater than God, but why should we go with your definition of what, of what God is? So interesting yeah, stuff. It is. It is indeed, you know, and um, I'm not so sure. Really. Yeah. There, there is one question here for both of us, actually. Mm -hmm. Do either of you know of the ecumenical interfaith movement or have any opinion of it, uh, on it? <clears throat> um, I think it's talking just about mixing between, uh, the Abrahamic religions, technically speaking, I know so many different kinds of that that I'm not sure exactly what they're what they're talking about. Um, yeah, because I mean, uh, yeah, you have the uh, the, uh, the like Chrislam, you know, yeah. or something to that extent. I mean, if we're talking Chrislam or approving of Islam as an Abrahamic religion, as if like anyone who follows Islam have the same path as someone who is following Christianity, for instance, I disagree with that. I don't even think a Jew who doesn't know Christ will even make it to heaven. 
because Jesus came basically to die for all of humanity. There was no exclusivity here. So uh, with all due respect, I mean, I hope I'm not upsetting any, anybody here, but I'm just sharing that with you the truth of the Bible. The Bible is very clear. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, that no one means everybody. No one comes to the Father in heaven except through me. So you have to go through Christ. How can you go through Christ? By accepting Christ, basically, as Lord and Savior. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so, it, you know, when, when people talk about interfaith, um, it, it, it depends on what you mean, right? If we pretend that, you know, we don't have differences or we don't have, uh, or that our differences don't matter or that uh, all religions are equally true, guess what? All of our religions reject that. Why would, we dis why would we insult and dishonor all of our religions by saying that they all teach the same thing or that they're, or that they're all equally true? Uh, as far as Christians and Muslims and Jews and Hindus all getting along and saying, hey, you know, we have our disagreements and it'd be great to discuss those things and see who's right because the possibilities here are one of us is right and the others are wrong or, or none of us is right and something else is true, right? But I mean, if we really care about each other, then we should be we should be happy having discussions and trying to get to the to the bottom of this. Um, fine with that. That stuff's awesome. Yeah, it's when we it's when we pretend that we don't have disagreements or, or that we don't matter or we try to we think that it's bad to even have the discussion. Uh, matter of fact, there, there's a perfect comment here. Uh, DJM, DJM in the uh, in the super chat here. DJM brought up the comment earlier about hey, you know, what do you need to believe in God for? Why can't you just you know you know, treat others the way you want to be treated or something like that. So we right. had that. Um, but he said, uh, uh, thanks for a nice discussion, David Wood and Alfadi. I hope that the chat participants learned something. I disagree at times, but still respect you. Take care, everyone, including our Muslim friends. That's what I'm talking about, right? So we, we disagree, right? He, he posed an objection to what we're saying. We responded to the objection. He's not, he's not hurt. He's not upset over it, right? right. We're not upset. We disagreed. We talked, and so on. Uh, even some, even someone like like Omar. I'm, I'm still, I, I'm still. I mean, it's, it's depressing. It's depressing how almost every Muslim who's been commenting today has just spouted complete, utter, total nonsense. Completely false according to their books. Completely false according to our books. It's like there's no respect for truth at all. That's depressing. But don't have any hard feelings. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of amusing, kind of amusing, kind of depressing because, you know, it's like, gosh, look what this religion does to these people. But, you know, at the, at the end of the day, um, hey, if you, you know, if you disagree with us, then, then cool, let's get together and, and see if we can figure it out. And even if we can't, let's, you know, let's, let's at least get along. And why, why does everyone freak out as soon as someone starts disagreeing with them? Anyway, so the point yeah. here is, hey, if you're, if you're atheist, Muslim, Hindu, whatever, and you can, you know, you, you, you come around and you raise some disagreements, but when your disagreements are responded to or disagreements about your position are raised, you're fine with it and you respect other people's right to have a discussion, you're fine with me. You're totally, you're totally fine with me. If you're not out violently subjugating, you're not throwing a tantrum anytime someone disagrees with you, you're, 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 you're good with me and you're welcome here. Yeah. Uh, if I may take just one last question, at mm -hmm. least myself, uh, Omar again, uh, he, he's every saying, time I think we're out, I know if Omar pulls us back in, he's saying, if that's true, <laughs> then why does it say in the Quran that God does not have a son and God is not three? How could he be copy and paste? Do you see your flaw? Do you see your flaw, Omar? You're using a book that I don't believe in to begin with. A book that even butchered the doctrine of the Trinity. Here's the doctrine of the Trinity. They believe in one God who revealed himself in three distinct persons. Co-equal, co-eternal, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Please show me where did the Quran describe the Trinity this way. The Quran says that the Trinity is God the Father, God the Mother, and God the Son. The Quran says that God is one-third of three. The Quran says that we worship three gods. Show me where does the Bible say any of these things. So, with all due respect, your book is expired, basically, because it did not really rely on the truth. That's why I'm not going to take your question seriously about the Trinity, because that's not what the Bible teaches in the first place. All right. Um, well, we've been going uh, about an hour and 15 minutes, but uh, yeah, so everyone, it'd be cool to stay longer and chat more, but we do have some videos to record, right? Got Something some videos like to record. Yeah, we got a, uh, I think just in this series that we're recording so far, it's looking like it's going to be about 17 or 18 videos. That's right. 
Uh, and if we can get some other stuff done, we're going to get that done too. So we're going to go ahead and uh, wrap up. Uh, this is uh, this is if you if you haven't if you haven't met Al Fadi before this, this is Al Fadi, and the link to his YouTube channel is in the description box. So the videos that we're recording right here, these are going to be on his channel. So Al Fadi has been recording uh, videos for a long time with people like. Uh, Jay Smith, and you did some with Anthony Rogers, right? That's right, yep. yes. We will be publishing it soon. So recording with Anthony Rogers. Unfortunately, he keeps recording videos with Sam Shamoon, shameless Sam Shamoon. Uh, keeps recording videos with him. But uh, yeah, I, I've done tons of videos with El Fadi um, over the past few years. So if you want to see what's coming out, be sure to subscribe so you and, and hit click the bell so you get the notification when those come out. Um, all right. Well, I will be live in a couple days and I'm going to be inviting some, some Muslims to come on with me uh, live so that we can solve some disputes. Uh, other than that, I uh, got a debate coming up on Sunday. That should be on the channel Modern Day Debate. So check out Modern Day Debate. Got a debate there on Sunday and another one on Monday. So see you all soon. Amen. Thank you.